All right. Amen. God bless you all. We're beginning our class today, our, our Wednesday Word Supper here on the 7th of August. And um, our theme is still upon this rock. I will build my church, uh, kind of where we started from last week. And we're going to go back to Matthew, kind of re, uh, Matthew 16, and kind of reiterate our main theme. And then we'll take off from there. So if you can go there with me in the scripture as well, we'll go from there and, and continue this area of study. All right, and we're going to begin at verse number 13. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked the disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias or Elijah, others Jeremiah, others uh, one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Peter, and Simon Peter answered, saying, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon bar Jonah, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And we stopped right there. Uh, and I think we still will stop right there for today because it continues to uh, give us the, just this area of focus. So I think we will eventually get to verse 19 about the keys. But let's go on from here where we are now. Upon this rock, I will build my church. Now, last week we discussed this. We got started on the conversation and understanding uh, that when he starts talking to Peter or Simon effectively, and um, he begins to call him, I call him Petros, Petros being the Greek word for a rocky ground or, or rocks or rocks in the ground and so forth. And then he said, upon this rock, he used another Greek word called Petra, two different words, Petros, Petra. And he made a big deal out of it because Petra is not like Petros. Petra is a large rock. Petra is a is bedrock, foundational rock things of foundation that the earth is effectively built upon. And that's what he's really emphasizing. The rock that I'm building the church on is not Peter. Peter is a little rock, a rock amongst the soil and so forth. But the big rock that the church is built upon is the bedrock. It's the foundational stone that all things can stand upon. The whole earth is built upon. And that's the difference between the two rocks that he's discussing. And then it, the idea, he says, I will build my church. And we dealt with this word church last week to, to an extent that from its Greek, uh, uh, earlier Greek uh, derivation, ecclesia, uh, some, some say ecclesia, uh, ecclesia, but uh, the um, the idea is the assembly or congregation is who he said, I will build or I, I will I will build an assembly uh, on this bedrock. On what bedrock that he said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. This is what Peter said, thou art the Christ, uh, the son of the living God. And it's, the, it's a response to that, that we see Jesus then saying, blessed art thou, Simon, Bah, uh, kind of a later derivation of saying son of Jonas. Uh, so it used to, they used this term being historically in Hebrew, being like Ben, like Benjamin, Ben, uh, Benjamin. Uh, but uh, at this point, by this time, uh, enough effects of other cultures and languages have in, impacted the uh, Jewish family to the point where now they're using this term uh, bar. Oh, so Simon Bar Yona, and he says, this information you have, you did not get on your own. You didn't figure it out. It's not a logical conclusion. My father, which is in heaven, he revealed this to you. And I'm going to also say this to you, that you are a little rock or a gravel, a part of the rock on the ground. And upon the great rock, the Petra, the bedrock, I will build my assembly. 
and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So there is also a promise built into this word that the gates of hell shall not be able to successfully overcome the assembly that I'm going to build. There's our key. Now, we went back a little bit also into the uh, into the book of Proverbs and in Ecclesiastes, and we can see the, um, the advent of Solomon and the reference to him as a Kohelet or preacher or caller, the caller of the assembly. That's who the preacher is. In this case, Yeshua himself is the originator or the original caller of the assembly. And then it branches out from there. <clears throat> He's the preacher and he calls to those who are uniquely called by him. Hallelujah. That's who we are, by the way. Not anybody, not accidentally, but chosen and called by God. All right. That's very, very key and very important for us. Praise God. <clears throat> Now, we're going to go from there to understand a little bit deeper to what the psalmist says. We're on a strong foundation, but in Psalm 62, he gives us some details on that foundation that I want us to look at. So go to Psalm 62, a little water, and then we'll uh, take off from there. He makes an important statement and it's an expression as uh, the psalmist clarifies how he knows his salvation is sound. So this is really great. This is really important for us. Uh, so he says, truly, my soul waiteth upon the Lord. Psalm 62 and 1. Up upon the Lord, I apologize. Upon, upon God, from him cometh my salvation. I'm distinct, distinct, uh, distinctively and separating, uh, creating a distinction between the Lord and God for the purpose of uh, understanding is that when the psalmist is writing here, he is calling from the perspective of God, not as a master, like an Adonai or ruler, my Lord, but as the mighty God, Elohim, okay? Truly my soul waits upon Elohim. From him cometh my salvation. From who? From Elohim. My salvation comes from this mighty God. So. One of the problems we have in uh, religion thoughts, um, a little bit within certain types of orthodoxy, is that the idea of uh, earning your way is prominent. That somehow uh, some of the elements of uh, you yourself being able to make yourself right, it has crept into the church. And there are people who think they are earning their way to salvation. You work out your soul salvation. You work out what you have. You work out the gift that you have. You bring forth fruitfulness to the kingdom you belong to because you are saved. Your work doesn't cause you to be saved. Your salvation is already present. That's a very important point that we should not lose track of because some people have lost themselves in thinking they have disqualified themselves or somehow they are no longer within range to be qualified because of something that their work or they failed to do. And that's not accurate according to scripture. First Corinthians chapter three, and I'll be back to Psalm, but first Corinthians chapter three has very good important note for us to have in regard to that, uh, that he says very important that, uh, Verse 12, 3 and 12. Now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's uh, work shall be made manifest or revealed, for the day shall declare it. The day of the Lord is a reference here, because it shall be revealed by fire, the day of the Lord. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If a man's work abide which he has built thereupon he shall receive a reward if any man's work shall be burned he shall suffer loss all right so so far what we have clarity is that the works will be tested by fire to see if they are authentic the way you see if something is pure gold you put real fire to it gold stays gold even though you put heat on it it still stays gold it melts it'll run but it's still gold 
But if it's not truly what it appears to be, it'll be burned. All right, meaning it's not uh, it's not uh, pure. All right, so he goes on to say, if your work is burned, you will suffer loss. Yeah, right, because what you did is not going to stand. However, but he himself shall be saved, yet so, even through the fire. All right, so it's important that you know that your your work is a is a reflection of your service, and and it does count. But it is not your work that causes you to be saved. You're saved by grace. We've been over this a hundred times, but Ephesians 2, uh, 2 and 8, right? For by grace are you saved through, through uh, faith and not that of yourself, but it's the gift of God. All right, back to Psalm 62, though. Let's go back. So truly my soul waiteth upon Elohim, Psalm 62 and 1, from whom, from him cometh my salvation. He only is my rock and my salvation. So another important element to make sure, don't start putting anything else. I just dealt with your own works, but anything else, any old magical ideas, uh, any superstitious ideas, any family lineage ideas or family curse ideas, nothing else. Watch what he says. He only is my salvation my rock and my salvation. He only, he alone is my rock and my salvation. All right. Nothing that anybody else did makes a difference. Moving on. Uh, he is my defense. I shall, sh I shall not be greatly moved. No one's going to shift me out of my position here. No one's going to push me and tug me away from the faith I have from the salvation that I have received because he is my rock and my salvation. Very key, critical element for us to hold on to and, and build our, our faith on and therefore not let go. That's why you don't let go. All right. Uh, how long will you imagine mischief against a man? Uh, ye, shall be sl ye shall be slaying all of you as a bowling wall shall ye be and as a tottering fence, and this is David. So remember, our psalmist here is, is a man who is frequently engaged in battle and warfare. And David is saying, listen, how long are you going to keep trying to mess with the child of God? And that's you and that's I. Uh, how long will the world and people who think that they can conquer or abuse the children of God uh, keep doing that, thinking that, oh, well, I'm going to pull this off and pull this off on them. At some point, they need to realize they shall be as a bowling wall, a wall in which the bricks are not set and the wall is starting to bow, you know, a fence that's tottering, getting ready to fall over. You know, they're eventually going to stumble and they're going to fall because they are coming against the Lord's children. And what does he say, right? He says, um, no weapon formed against thee shall prosper, and every tongue that rises against thee thou shalt condemn. And there shall be a day of the Lord against those who are trying to destroy the children of God. So this is what David is saying here. Now, the, the other part of it that he's saying is really important. He says, my soul waiteth upon God. I am completely resting, focused on, and presenting myself upon the Lord and to the Lord. Is there anybody else, anyone else more important than him? My focus is on the Lord. And therefore, that's who I'm going to wait on. That's where my confidence will be. That's what and who I will rely upon is on the Lord, nothing else. Really, really key point. As we talk about this called assembly, Jesus called, Yahweh called, the God, the mighty God, having called uh, as a preacher in the Old Testament, as a prophet, as, as, as the many prophets that we will discuss in a later point, uh, that is the foundation, that is the rock, that is the, the strength that you are being called on, God himself, or Jesus himself, being a major portion of that, as Ephesians chapter 2 will also later explain to us. But let's go back, finish a little bit more of Psalm 62. Now, he says something else in verse 5. My soul waited only upon God, again, uh, Elohim, for my expectation is from him. Now, that's another challenge. Because how many people who are believers in God and saying they're part of the assembly or the church of God have some kind of, um, you know, some kind of feelings often effectively 
against someone uh, within the church or the body of Christ, or they've been offended some way by someone in the church or, or in the body of Christ, as it were, and have given themselves a leave from the body of Christ because of something some human did within the church. God never said the people within the assembly were going to be perfect. He's perfect. His love is perfect. His son and his gift for us is perfect. But he never said all the people were going to be perfect. That doesn't change anything. You know, you are you live in a country, in our, in our case, the United States of America. All right. Yes, we're one country, one nation under God, indivisible, right? We're living in truth and justice for all, right? But everyone within it is not perfect. And we're not all unified as we would like to be. God never said humans would ever be perfect until he comes back. There is no perfection of human beings. However, that doesn't stop us from acting on our call. Our job, our mission is still true and still valid. My soul, well, let's go back to him, waited only upon God for my expectation is from him. I'm only looking for him to be right. No one else, no one else. He only is my rock. Back to that, upon this rock. He only is the my rock. That word in the Hebrew is this word, sir, sir. And the sir means this massive, prominent stone, rock, rock face and crags and so forth. Uh, that's what it's a reference to, sir. It's, he only is my uh, rock. And I shall, let's, let's read this next part of it. And I shall not be moved. I love this word. He's my rock. He's my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. How many have made up your mind, children of God, people who've heard the call of God, people who are part of them who he has, God is assembling, whom God is assembling. So one of the things that we've lost in the modern church and certainly in the last three, 400 years within the uh, European and Western churches uh, in which we are a part of, is the idea that we are an assembly. A lot of people think Notre Dame is a church. Notre Dame Cathedral is a church. I'm not trying to beat up Notre Dame Cathedral, but Notre Dame, Dame Cathedral is not a church. It's a building. Like a lot of buildings you see up and down the roads and the streets, many of them have no more God's spirit in them than a stone on the ground. You know, God's spirit is not present there. We are the place that God has placed his spirit. We are the, 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 the body or the building that God has focused on. You know, it's not brick and mortar that God has focused on, but it's the hearts of men that he has entered into. He says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if any man will open up, I will come in. He's looking for people. He comes into us. He's a spirit. His spirit comes into our bodies. Our bodies become the temple, right? The temple of God, right? Corinthians teaches us, right? First Corinthians. So uh, this is the focus that we should have. Let's go on a little further to First Peter, and we'll wrap up here, I think, for today. First Peter, chapter uh, one. First Peter, chapter one, and um, go further along this line. Verse fifteen, he says. But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Conversation, again, meaning in the Greek, coming from the Greek word, the idea is that you are your lifestyle. Your conversation is how you handle yourself, what you do as you interact with other people on li in life, daily life. That's your conversation, okay? All right. And so he says, be it. Because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. And if ye call on the Father, who without respect of persons judges according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from, your vain, from the vain conversations received by traditions from your fathers. All right. So, so to, just to make sure that we stay on, on point here, he's saying your, your redemption didn't come from corruptible things. All right. The things that your parents, your fathers, your mothers, your ancestry, 
and particularly in the context he's talking to a Jewish ancestry here, uh, because a lot of them are engaged here and trying to say this and trying to say that. And they're, you know, say, well, we were this, we were that, you know, this is our history. And he said, listen, stop worrying about that stuff. You should worry about whether that you are really receiving the spirit of God. That's the real issue that you need to uh, focus on, the spirit of God, all right? And so he says, don't worry about that stuff, that those corruptible things. The more important things is what he's going to say next in verse 19. But with the precious blood of Christ, all right, as a lamb without blemish and without spot. So important. That's how you are redeemed, by the precious blood of Christ. So it's not a measure at all of what we ourselves had put together for by grace are you saved back to right ephesians 2 and 8 right for by grace are you saved it's the precious blood of christ that called us to be redeemed and then called us to have that for uh that 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 foreknown relationship that he said you know what i know you and i know the very number of hairs on your head and i've known you and i knew you from before the day you were formed in your mother's belly as the conversation he has with Jeremiah, right? He says, I know you and I called you. I know your name. You're saved. You're part of the assembly of God because I called you and you heard my voice. That's why you're here right now. A little bit more here. Um, uh, but with the precious blood of Christ, all right? Uh, and who was, let me just go a little bit further, verse 20, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was, and was along with manifested in these last times uh, for you, that word kai there in Greek, is coming from, uh, who by him do believe in God and have, that he has raised him up from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God, look at this. I love this Peter right here, man. This first Peter chapter one. Oh my goodness. So the reason you have faith in God, the reason you have trust in God is because of what he did for you. And that's what's operating on the inside of you. That's why you don't give up. That's why you don't quit. That's why you don't uh, believe in all the chaos. Sage you know, burning sage and crystals and um, astrology and all these different things that people in the world are all wandering around. They're trying to figure out all the kind of pagan things that they're doing because they don't know the way to salvation. That way to salvation is a free gift that comes by the blood of this precious lamb. That lamb symbolizing is the lamb is the blood of Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach. And he has given his blood because it's a man that sinned and it was a man that had to atone for sin. And that's why he came here and paid that price as a man. So, oh, wow, there's so much here, but we're going to get to it. So God bless. I pray that as you think about this deeper and deeper, you realize your salvation is not, I'm going to re revisit this one phrase in here. For as much as you know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things. Praise God. You were not redeemed with anything that could be corrupted, but your redemption is by the precious blood of Christ. That's why I'm not going anywhere. That's why it won't fail. That's why he won't fail. That's why my purpose won't fail. The purpose I have in him. Is because my redemption, my call, being called out of darkness, my being collected back up, my being drawn back to the family, like Gomer, who was a prostitute. As the Lord said, you know, you're not my people. But then he said, you know, Lo, 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 Ami, you're not my people. Then he said, no, no, but you know what? The one who I said was not my people, guess what? I'm, I'm actually going to gather them. I'm actually going to get them back. You know what? I still love them. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son and whosoever believeth him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's what's happening. It's so much, you know. His love is so big. I'm going to get them back. Israel will be saved. Look at God. Look at God. All the things that went wrong and that they did wrong, even to the slaying of his son, he still says, ah, I'm going to get you back. And that's what God is saying to you and I, all of us, you know. No matter what, if you're, that heart is faith is in you already. I'm going to get you back. 
life. So I pray that this blesses you as it blesses me as the body of Christ, that those who are the God is building, how he builds his church, and uh, that you will be able to share this with others as God gives you the opportunity to minister. So in Jesus' name I pray and amen.